The Schrodinger equation is widely regarded as the most important equation in quantum physics. For any system that we're studying, it can describe the probability of finding our system in different states when we make a measurement on it. And it also looks at how these probabilities change over time. Although it's an extremely versatile and useful equation, it's limited in that it doesn't take into account theories such as Einstein's special relativity. So in this video, we'll be looking at two upgraded equations that do incorporate other important physics theories, but as a result, are more complicated than the Schrodinger equation. Hi there, my name's Bart, and I make fun physics videos on this channel. So if you enjoyed this one, then please hit the like button and subscribe. Let's get into it. First of all, let's talk a bit about the Schrodinger equation and what it tells us. Let's say we're studying a simple system, such as a single electron, maybe in between two nuclei that are very far apart from each other. The Schrodinger equation allows us to plug in information about our system, such as the fact that we're studying an electron between two nuclei that we're assuming to be stationary in this case. And it then allows us to find out things about the electron, which is primarily what we're studying. For example, we could calculate how likely we are to find the electron at different positions in between the two nuclei. That's what this quantity, psi, the wave function, is directly related to. It's known as a wave function because it can move through space and change over time like a wave. But this time it's kind of a wave of probability almost. If you'd like to know more about the Schrodinger equation, then check out this video up here. It'll also be linked in the description below. The important thing for us to know here is that it's a wave equation and it's not relativistic. Basically, it doesn't take into account the theory of relativity. So for example, when objects move very quickly relative to each other, then some interesting effects start to show up, such as time passing at different rates from one object's perspective to the other, and also distances being measured differently from each object. The Schrodinger equation doesn't account for these effects. It also treats time very differently to how it treats space. Whereas in relativity, time and space are treated on a fairly level footing, in the sense that with some maths, time can be treated as a fourth dimension to go alongside the three dimensions of space that we work with. Now, one way to think about the Schrodinger equation, in a sort of hand-wavy, loose way, is to start with the fact that for any object that has mass, its kinetic energy is given by half mv squared, where m is its mass and v is the speed with which it's moving. We can write this term with momentum, p in it, in which case it would look like this. Feel free to pause the video and confirm that this actually works. Then we can add to the object's kinetic energy any potential energy that it experiences. Now, there's no one single equation for potential energy because obviously it depends on what kind of potential energy our object is experiencing. So we just add a general potential energy term v. And hence, what we're saying with this equation is that our object's kinetic energy plus its potential energy is equal to its total energy. And the weird thing about quantum mechanics is that each of these terms contains a measurement operator, which basically just means that the operator has to act on a wave function, which is of course how we encode stuff about the system itself. And the measurement operator basically tells us how we would make a measurement on our system to find out something about it, like its momentum or its potential. And so a simple way to understand this equation is kinetic energy plus potential energy equals total energy. Now, like I said, this is a bit hand wavy, but works for our purposes. So that's the Schrodinger equation in essence. Now, if we want to include the effects of relativity into a similar sort of equation, then we actually start with Einstein's famous relationship between an object's mass and its energy. E is equal to mc squared. Here, m is the object's mass, E is its total energy, and C is the speed with which light travels in a vacuum. In other words, the equation tells us how much energy an object has when it's made of a given amount of mass. But importantly, this equation is incomplete. It only deals with objects that are not moving. The full version of this equation actually looks like this. It incorporates the object's momentum, which it will have if it's moving, if it's an object with mass, of course, right? Well, interestingly, even photons, particles of light, which have no mass, can still carry momentum. So in other words, the momentum equation that we're taught in high school, p is equal to mv, only works for things with mass. For photons without mass, the momentum is given by their energy, e, divided by the speed of light, c. 
Anyway, coming back to our general equation, which describes all objects, we then do some mathematical manipulation, which we won't go into in this video, but I'll definitely cover in a future video. And what we get to is an equation that looks a bit like this. This is known as the Klein-Gordon equation. Here are the important things to know about it. Firstly, as we've seen by starting with Einstein's famous equation, this equation incorporates into it the theory of special relativity, unlike the Schrodinger equation. The Klein-Gordon equation is also quantum in the sense that it deals with measurement operators and quantized measurement results, meaning that for a given system, only some measurement results are possible as opposed to a whole infinite spectrum of them. Next, this psi here doesn't quite mean the same thing in the Klein-Gordon equation as it does in the Schrodinger equation. In the Schrodinger equation, we interpreted psi as being related to probabilities of measurement results. Specifically, if we want to get technical, the modulus of psi squared gave us probabilities. But in the Klein-Gordon equation, this quantity doesn't always have to be positive, and it doesn't make sense to have negative probabilities. Therefore, this quantity is actually interpreted as representing charge density. And this equation tells us about the relativistic and quantum behavior of particles with positive, negative, or zero charge. Again, I'll discuss this more in a future video on the Klein-Gordon equation, so please do be sure to subscribe if you're interested in that. Now, here's the interesting thing about the Klein-Gordon equation. Although it's a wonderful first step towards combining special relativity and quantum mechanics into one neat equation, it's also limited in that it doesn't account for a particle property called spin. Spin is a quantity that particles can possess, just like charge and mass. And it's a measure of how much angular momentum a particle naturally has, even when it's not rotating or moving along a curved path. So what do we mean by that? Basically, we know that for objects to have momentum, specifically linear momentum, they have to move in a straight line. And for objects to have angular momentum, they have to rotate or move along a curved path. Well, some particles behave like they have some amount of angular momentum built in. Even if they're not rotating or moving along a curved path, their angular momentum is not necessarily zero. This inherent angular momentum is what we call spin. For more information about spin, check out this video, which is, again, also linked in the description. So, the Klein-Gordon equation doesn't account for spin. Or more accurately, it only really works for particles that have zero spin. In order to account for spin, we need to look at another equation that is also ideally quantum mechanical and special relativistic in nature. The equation we'll go for is the rather famous but hugely difficult to understand Dirac equation. To understand the Dirac equation, I'm going to use a loose analogy. In a very rough way, the Dirac equation is basically the square root of the Klein-Gordon equation. Or in other words, if you do the equivalent of squaring the Dirac equation, you get the Klein-Gordon equation. So how does the Dirac equation account for spin when its square, the Klein-Gordon equation, doesn't? And again, remember, I'm using very loose terminology here. It's just to give us a feel of the two equations. Well, the reason that the Klein-Gordon equation doesn't account for spin when the Dirac equation does is because the equivalent of squaring actually loses information. This is in the same way that the square of negative 2 and the square of positive 2 are the same value. The squared version has lost information about what we squared to get to it, because both give us the same result, right? So we don't know if we squared minus 2 to get 4, or we squared plus 2 to get 4. We've lost information. However, if we look at the original values themselves, we still have that information. Did we square negative 2 or did we square positive 2? In a similar way, the Dirac equation contains information about spin that is lost when getting to the Klein-Gordon equation. Now, I'm going to keep saying this in this video, but that's a very surface-level, hand-wavy explanation, but it does give us a good feel and a good analogy for how the Dirac and Klein-Gordon equations relate to each other. And I'll definitely be making a full video on the Dirac equation, where I'd like to discuss all of this in more detail as well. But in essence, the Dirac equation picks up where the Klein-Gordon equation left off, and now deals with particles that don't have zero spin. In fact, it deals very nicely with particles that have what is known as spin one-half. Particles like protons, neutrons, and electrons. Very handy, because these are the particles that make up most of what we can observe around us. Whereas the Klein-Gordon equation, with its spin zero bias, deals with more exotic and rare particles that don't even exist for very long before decaying into other types of particles. The Dirac equation introduces some extra degrees of freedom into its psi quantity. 
This time, Psi has four components, each of which can be complex numbers. Two of these components very closely resemble the Psi we used in the Schrodinger equation. But then there's two more degrees of freedom that contain all the extra particle information we'd need to know if it behaved in both a quantum and a relativistic way. Also, the Dirac equation first predicted the existence of particles which have the same mass as particles that we're already familiar with, but have the exact opposite charge. So for example, if an electron normally has a given mass and a charge of minus one unit, then the Dirac equation said that a particle with the same mass, but with plus one unit of charge should also be possible. At first, Paul Dirac thought that this was a mistake in his mathematics and that his equation wasn't constrained enough but then it turned out that these kinds of particles do actually exist. Nowadays, we call them antimatter. The point I'm trying to make is that physics equations should describe our universe accurately. And when physicists develop theories, sometimes they can be under constrained and mathematically allow for things that we don't seem to observe in the real universe. For example, by allowing both positive and negative solutions to things that seemingly should only have positive solutions. But in other cases, the equations are not under constraint at all and can serve as predictions for things that we haven't yet observed. In the case of antimatter, it's because particles of antimatter are very rare in our universe, or at least the bits that we can access. And from what we can tell, they also annihilate when they meet their matter counterparts and all of the mass is converted to energy. We don't know yet why this is the case, and one of the biggest unsolved problems in physics at the moment is why there seems to be so much more matter than antimatter out there in the universe. But the existence of antimatter was first seen through the Dirac equation, and considered a mistake by the brilliant bloke who came up with it. So with all that being said, I'd like to finish up here. We've looked at two quantum mechanical wave equations that also incorporate the theory of special relativity in different ways. The Schrodinger equation, which is non-relativistic, is still extremely useful and works brilliantly in any quantum system where high speeds are not involved, which let's be honest, is most of them. Now, as I've mentioned, I'll be making videos on each of the two new equations that we've seen here, discussing them in more detail, breaking down their mathematics and explaining what each term represents in detail as well. So please do subscribe if that sounds like something you'd be interested in. And if you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, hit that bell button as well for more fun physics content. Please check out my merch linked in the description. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And finally, a huge thanks to all of my Giga patrons and all the others over on my Patreon page. That's also linked in the description if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you very soon.